today's video is brought to you by Audible. Let's start today's video off with a bit of a fun fact. All the way back in 1899, various artists were commissioned by a cigar company in Paris to create an image series that depicted what life in Paris would look like by the year 2000. Now, most of these predictions ended up being way off, but in one of the cards, it depicts a bunch of children in a classroom, essentially having the words from their textbooks wired directly into their head. Fast forward to the modern day, and the wires are optional. And with today's sponsor, Audible, you can get the words from over 200,000 titles consisting of every genre imaginable directly to your brain anytime you want. And that's not even bringing up the Audible Plus catalog, which also includes a variety of Audible exclusive titles, as well as podcasts on a variety of topics. Now, I think many of you know by now I'm a big fan of Audible, not just because I prefer to consume a majority of my content through listening, but the list of titles that have played a role in at least some videos creation just continues to grow with each episode I do. That being said, the most recent title I enjoyed outside of these videos was Catch and Kill by Ronan Farrow, which gives a look behind the scenes at the Harvey Weinstein situation and why that story took so long to come out. And you can get this title or any title of your choosing absolutely free for 30 days when you go to audible.com slash sociable or text sociable to 500 500. Once again, that's audible.com slash sociable or text sociable to 500 500. And thank you once again to Audible for making this video possible. Such a surfer, right? Well, the Electric Daisy Carnival brought hundreds of thousands of people to Central Florida. You couldn't miss the thing. The massive music <laughs> festival went by with only a handful of arrests. Despite those low arrest numbers, News 6 has learned thieves were working that crowd. Chicago police say they recovered more than 120 phones that were stolen during the four-day music festival here at Grand Park. The Austin police are investigating an international crime ring targeting Austin City Limits music festival people. Now, authorities believe a half dozen people worked together to steal 1,000 cell phones from festival attendees. This lady picketing pocketed me yesterday and so many others today at something in the water festival. Hey, she's still the phone. Yes, she's still the phone. She's still the phone, sir. An employee at the AT&T store in Orange Beach says people were waiting for the store to open this morning to get new phones. The employee says around 50 people have gotten their phones replaced today after they were stolen out of pockets and backpacks at the festival. Hub, me throwing hands with the dude stealing phones at the festival. Swiping not dozens, but hundreds of people's cell phones. Only News Six's Eric Von Anken discovered there have been multiple arrests since then, and the thieves were likely highly organized in this case. He's live at Camping World Stadium where this all happened. So, Eric, how many phones did these crooks manage to steal? I'll tell you this, Matt, we know that hundreds of people were in line here at EDC Saturday night in the Lost and Found line looking for their phones. Austin police tell us they have made five arrests, but believe more people were involved. 100 people have been formally charged now, accused of stealing electronics in the DFW area and then selling them overseas. Photos from a KVU viewer show a bag cut open before the phone inside was stolen. China? 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 Bro, her phone really got stolen and ended up in China. It was stolen in Astral World almost a month ago. Now it's in motherfucking China. Oh, wait, time out, because my phone was stolen at Rolling Loud. Here, you see this? You see this location? My phone is in the same spot as theirs. Hello again, and welcome back to the channel bit of an impromptu video while I continue to work on other things, but as of recently, a new trend or phenomenon has popped up on social media and I want to take some time to sort of demystify things as always. If you take a look around on Reddit, Twitter, YouTube Shorts, or TikTok, you'll see pretty much the exact same thing, just in a different form for each platform. It seems like everybody who's had an iPhone stolen recently is reporting more or less the exact same thing. 
Their phone is now in China, sending a ping from the exact same place. This is South Wafa Road in Shenzhen, China. It seems to be one of the most common locations for stolen iPhones in America to end up. But generally speaking, the broader area these phones end up in is Haoshengbei Subdistrict. And I should add, it's not just that these phones are ending up in the exact same place. Perhaps what's even more interesting is if you take a look online at any number of these posts about this, you'll find that almost all of the phones are being stolen from music festivals. A quick Google search for Haosheng Bay and you'll quickly learn that this neighborhood is essentially the largest second-hand parts market for smartphones in the world. Most of the smartphones from China come from here. And that being said, the second-hand market here is so ridiculously large, there have been YouTubers who have gone here and built their own custom iPhone from scratch. Additionally, you can also find knockoff iPhones in Haosheng Bay. Now, while you might think that having a massive amount of Find My iPhone data and pings might make it incredibly easy to prosecute this type of criminal activity. So far, it seems like there's not much attention on this story. While countless news stories over the past couple years have picked up on the pickpocket rings at music festivals, nobody seems to have tied the two stories together where these phones are actually ending up. And I should add that phone theft from crowded places isn't really a new thing, but this is. The sheer amount of reports on social media pointing to their phones ending up on the exact same block is incredibly surprising. And if you were to take a screenshot found on the internet from someone's Find My iPhone, it's pretty easy to figure out where these businesses are. Now I want you to keep in mind the range for the iPhone's ping listed here. Referencing another map, we can see that across Shenan Middle Road, there's a block with a bunch of cell phone stores and iPhone refurbishing centers. Here in the review section, people report a similar phenomenon. And following the Google reviews to various markets in and around this same area, we see the same exact thing. Now, many people on social media have been quick to assume that this is simply just a case of phones being stripped down and sold cheaply for parts in Haosheng Bay. And while I believe this theory to be mostly true, it's worth pointing out that there's a demand for iPhone parts around the world, not just this location. What does make this location unique, though, is the Foxconn facility. This is a major iPhone assembly plant that's located just about 25 minutes away. This has led to some theories suggesting that Foxconn is buying the stolen parts to reassemble its new phones. While some who support the theory cite the supply chain issues Apple was facing a couple years back, I would counter that by saying that there have been stolen phones shipped here well before any of this. And outside of this being a theory, there's not really much evidence to support it. But on the more surprising side, I'll add that this manufacturing plant does have a long laundry list of scandals tied to it. Managers have been caught in internal theft rings multiple times, essentially embezzling iPhones. In other cases, they got caught selling illegal activations onto Chinese networks. In other cases, Apple's even had to deal with someone at that facility stealing prototype phones, smuggling them out, and then reselling them. So while there has been some criminal activity at this location, I think what's going on here is more so a standard case of phone trafficking. And like I said, while some iPhones will definitely be stripped down for parts, Generally, what will actually happen to the phones depends on whether or not the iPhone can be freed from its iCloud lock and resold. While Apple likes to make it seem like the iCloud lock essentially makes the phone a brick, there are a number of different methods used by criminals to bypass this countermeasure. So let's explore a few of these, as well as explore the broader topic of iPhone trafficking. But a bit of a disclaimer for the rest of this video going forward, I obviously do not condone you breaking the law and this entire video is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Shortly after most people have their phones stolen, victims are often bombarded with a series of emails and texts to their iCloud alerting them that their phone has been found. The victim will then follow the link to a fake login page to track their phone. It's here that their login credentials can be harvested if they fall for it. What stands out when it comes to iCloud phishing is the specialized tools available for this illegal practice. There are entire phishing kits designed to streamline this process. Some offer ways to send custom texts or other messages impersonating Apple. Others offer a way to create a fake GPS map to spoof where the phone was found. For those who participate in this act, it's a numbers game, and the software makes this far easier to oversee multiple victims at a time. This is perhaps the most known method when it comes to freeing a phone from its iCloud lock, as it is often reported in tandem with someone having their phone stolen. And 
And while not everybody is guaranteed to fall for the first method, another method that seems to have had some success in the past is walking into an Apple store and convincing a manager to unlock the phone. Usually the script for this method goes something like, hey, I forgot my login credentials, but I can prove that I own the phone. Here is a receipt. Once again, this industry is so large that there are entire Telegram channels who specialize in selling fake receipts and invoices for individuals to attempt this. But obviously there's some added risk if something goes wrong, like if the phone was already reported stolen. In some cases though, perhaps going into the Apple store is an added step. As according to the reporting by Motherboard, in some cases, users have had success with this method over just email. But at the end of the day, perhaps a more surefire way to get this done is with a corrupt Apple Store manager. I can't imagine that Apple wouldn't have any oversight on this kind of thing. But I'll add, when it comes to other phone trafficking schemes that have happened in the past, many involve the use of an inside person. In September of 2019, the jailbreaking community for iPhones got the biggest news they'd had in years. That was when an individual named Axiom X released an exploit called Checkmate. This was a very big vulnerability that was found and to quote ARS Technica, unlike just about every jailbreak exploit released in the past nine years, it targets the iOS boot ROM, which contains the very first code that's executed when an iDevice is turned on. Because the boot ROM is contained in the read-only memory inside a chip, jailbreak vulnerabilities that reside there can't be patched. This meant that for many generations of iPhones, from iPhone 4S to iPhone X, users would have a permanent vulnerability that would allow them to run any unsigned code at the boot ROM level that they wanted. While for most jailbreakers and security researchers at the time this was a breakthrough, the vulnerability is now used to bypass the iCloud lock on these devices and restore the phone to factory settings. This vulnerability has become so popular now that various companies with their own tools exist to streamline this process, pretty much enabling anybody with no technical knowledge to start laundering iPhones. Now, while these methods are the ones that are undoubtedly the most popular, that's not to say that others don't exist. And in the broader context of this illicit trade, this is only one specialized area. Many smartphone traffickers don't source their phones from the pockets of unsuspecting victims at concerts and many traffickers don't need to bypass the iCloud lock at all. You see, while iCloud locked phones are more often associated to physical theft, bad ESN phones are more often tied to activities such as fraud. And that leads me into this next section. While we've discussed the Apple iCloud lock, the other kind of kill switch on a phone is the carrier kill switch. When a phone is blacklisted in this kind of way, it can't make any kind of calls or use any kind of data. Generally, the nickname given to these types of devices is a bad ESN or a bad IMEI. And while a wireless carrier will blacklist the device if it's lost or stolen, generally the most common reason for this is that the phone was financed and has money owed on it. When a phone ends up in this state, the balance must be paid off first before it can be switched to a different carrier. And this is enforced by an international block list that companies and law enforcement around the world cross-reference using the phone's identification numbers which are tied to the hardware inside them. But that being said, not all countries enforce the same block list. So all a trafficker has to do is ship the phone out of the country and it can be set up with an overseas carrier free and clear. According to the GSMA's own website, as of today, China is not included in the IMEI block list, which may be a large factor in why so many phones are ending up in Haosheng Bay. While for many criminals, this method is far more lucrative and simple than parting the phones out, on the other hand, getting the phones is a bit more tricky. When it comes to trafficking rings tied to this scheme, they often get people's social security numbers and other info from vendors or hackers on places like the dark web. Then, using someone else's identity, they then go finance phones under someone else's name. You see, when you sign up for a phone contract, you pay next to nothing up front. But that comes with the promise to pay the phone back. But obviously, since we're talking about fraud, the criminal intention here is not to pay off the phone, it's to resell the phones near full price. And many fraud rings choose to ship the phones to countries where they can get more for the phone. You see, while one particular iPhone might go for $875 in the USA, that same phone will go for about $1,600 in Turkey. 
This is due to the local import taxes in that area. But obviously these criminals don't just walk into a wireless store and purchase the phone as themselves. The purchase of these phones is often orchestrated through straw buyers, often homeless people who are given fake identity and other documents to complete the contract. In other particularly heartless schemes, traffickers finance phones using the information of a homeless person they solicit, in turn ruining their credit further in exchange for a nominal upfront payment. It's a scheme targeting the homeless and the poor, and Jeremy recorded the whole thing on his iPhone. With my iPhone, I watched something suspicious go down at the Cherry Creek Apple Store. Several men signing numerous contracts for numerous iPhones within hours, but then giving them over to someone else. Even an Apple Store employee appeared to play a role, giving the iPhone straight to this guy. I really didn't think about it. All I heard was 200 bucks. Yeah. I'm broke. We saw David Sauer sign his name. I got more sleep bags. He lives at a local park. Sauer says he was picked up by this guy who promised all of that money if he signed contracts and turned over the phones. It was uh, 10 phones, give me 200 bucks. He was surprised his bad credit was good enough to get contracts, but he needs cash. Motel room, a bath, food. What did they promise you? They promised me about 200 or 300 in cash. We watched Jamal sign away too again and again. The same guy approached him on his way to donate plasma. Why were you going to donate plasma? You were just hard up for cash? Yeah, I just needed some cash at the moment. They promised me cash right after the cell phones were activated. They told me I'd make close to two to three hundred dollars. Phoenix, along with the others, say this guy promised they could just cancel the contracts later. No problem. Given this basic premise, every additional line that can be started is another device that can be resold. So for fraud rings that have access to compromised employees within wireless carriers, they are able to take this a step further. To give you an example, in one particularly large operation of 101 individuals that moved $100 million worth of product, the DOJ press release wrote, According to the superseding indictment, the conspirators also utilized compromised store employees to activate phones using fake identities or fraudulently adding lines to legitimate customer accounts. Other schemes allegedly involved the use of fake identity information as well as legitimate customer information to swap SIM cards, enabling the defendants to verify banking information through text messages and withdraw funds from customer accounts. As you can tell, fraud rings benefit greatly from having someone on the inside, and while in the context of phone trafficking it allows them to start additional fraudulent lines, the other thing that paragraph was referring to was the infamous SIM swap. And now, I'm sure many of you have heard about this already with how many people have been hacked as a result of this in the past few years. And while sometimes the employee is tricked and or hacked, there have been many such instances where the SIM swaps were an inside job. But continuing on, the other main method of sourcing phones by means of fraud is insurance fraud. Now, while the words insurance fraud are relatively self-explanatory, the basis for this method is simply using some form of fake ID to file a claim on a device that someone else owns. To quote the DOJ once more regarding an individual who defrauded around 200,000, from December 2017 to January 2020, Blanco and her conspirators devised a scheme to fraudulently obtain replacement cellular phones from an insurance company. Company 1 by assuming identities of wireless customers and filing false claims under Company One's handset insurance program, Blanco and her conspirators contacted Company One, posed as legitimate customers, and submitted false claims to Company One for damage, theft, or loss on hundreds of handsets owned by the customers. Blanco and her conspirators provided Company One with false identification, typically a fake New York or New Jersey driver's license, falsified to reflect the name of the legitimate customer. Now next up, we have warranty fraud, and I've really only seen about two major stories tied to this method. Both were Chinese nationals, and in both instances, the men had imported counterfeit iPhones into the USA and then attempted to return them to Apple under the pretenses that they wouldn't turn on and should be replaced under warranty. The devices that they returned were given a spoofed IMEI and serial number to match that of an in-warranty phone. Surprisingly, Apple seemingly couldn't tell the devices were fake for the longest time, allowing some 1,500 to be replaced for one guy, then some 2,500 for the other. Now, just like I said before, these are just the main methods when it comes to fraud trafficking. As you can probably tell, there's a lot of variance with how these schemes are run, and I'm sure there's others, but for now, 
you should at least have some familiarity with how these traffickers source the phones. But what we have yet to touch on is why these phones are ending up in the hands of legitimate retail stores. And that leads me into this next section. A criminal fence is simply defined as a buyer and seller of stolen goods, but perhaps a better way to understand this term is that fences are the middleman that works to move stolen goods back to the general retail customer. And that being said, when it comes to the discussion of stolen products, fencing is one of those topics that rarely sees any proper discussion. And to date, it's still perhaps one of the least researched subjects in criminology in spite of how common the crime actually is. To quote one paper entitled Behind the Fence, Buying and Selling Stolen Merchandise from 2003, it states, Police and security personnel in both the US and abroad have been hampered for years by lack of information about the hidden economy of the stolen goods market. Little academic research exists to detail the market for stolen goods, the black market for hot goods, the people who deal in these stolen goods, the people who purchase them, or the process involved in such exchanges. The main reason this topic is so hard to properly research is because fencing is a very low visibility crime. Fencing operations are often legitimate businesses that deal with stolen goods on the side. And in regards to our friends in Haosheng Bay, the use of a legitimate cell phone store and repair center for a fencing front is quite a common occurrence. You may notice that in your town there are often cell phone stores on like every single corner. Many are like these tiny hole in the wall shops that you often wonder how they stay in business. And while obviously not all of them are involved in illegal activity, many of these places can double as a fencing front where boosters locally sell stolen phones to. In many cases, these local cell phone stores are often the ones who wholesale large amounts of stolen phones overseas. And while these phone stores might appear modest, the amount of illicit money flowing through them can often be surprising. Yeah, Eric Melanie, federal agents as well as Houston police officers raided two homes and this business here on Harwin all at the same time this morning. You can see, see they are still making repairs there. The objective, they say, to take down a $65 million organized crime and money laundering scheme. Here alone, they say they seized 1,900 electric devices worth almost $2 million. Anywhere. According to the feds, the cell phone store would buy stolen phones, many obtained using stolen ID identities, others from burglaries and robberies. The store would then turn around and resell them overseas for profit. The two men, both living in high dollar homes with luxury cars in the garage, now face a number of criminal charges. A female employee was also arrested. Jessica Willie, ABC 13 Eyewitness News. Now, while pretty much any place that deals in secondhand merchandise can be wrapped up in fencing to some degree, whether they realize it or not, the type of establishment most people associate closely with fencing are pawn shops. While pawn shops are definitely another common fence that lead to the sale of smartphones overseas, the world of commerce, both legal and illegal, has moved online. Where in regards to phone trafficking, it seems that eBay has become the go-to platform for fencers in the modern day. And honest to God, you'd be very surprised at how many people just openly sell stolen products on places like eBay. And taking a look at just like this random listing here, this is someone's wedding photos. And then you go over and they even have a photo and it's like, yeah, this was uh, reported stolen by AT&T and here we are openly selling it on eBay. There's so many other listings like this. Now, in my opinion, there's a much bigger story here in regards to eBay intentionally turning a blind eye to stolen products sold on their platform. While eBay maintains that within their own policies, the sale of iCloud locked and kill switch devices is against their terms of service, as it, quote, encourages illegal activity. For some reason, thousands of sales are still being facilitated by major sellers every single day. And when confronted with this, this is what eBay representatives will tell the press numerous items 
come up. It's really crazy. eBay reps told me starting in 2014, they cracked down on iCloud locked phones. They said realistically, those phones are probably lost or stolen, stolen, and they don't want buyers to have a bad experience. Now, eBay reps say there are 800 million items on the site, and there's a group dedicated to working with law enforcement and retailers to curtail stolen goods. There are filters designed to block certain items like iCloud lock. However, some sellers change how words are spelled in the listing to get through those filters. For example, using a zero for an O. So eBay says it physically types in searches. These manual sweeps, we take that intelligence and we'll feed that back into our system. But as, like I said, we'll also look at those people obviously spelling it with zeros or spaces have obviously hit our blocks before and are trying to, you know, take different tactics to get around them and we'll take, you know, uh, you know more severe action against them. Furthermore, when it comes to carrier lock devices, if you were to list one today with the words bad ESN in the title, eBay would prevent you from completing that listing, citing the same policy from earlier. Where this gets very interesting though is when you poke around with some of the top sellers on this platform, because it appears that eBay was actively coaching their sellers on how to break their terms of service and bypass those filters put in place to prevent the sale of these particular items sold over two and a half million dollars worth of phones and we never had an issue selling bad ESM phones. It's always been allowed and most people in the phone flipping community have been selling bad ESM phones. There's no, been no issue up until just recently. So this was a big concern in the community about selling, you know, can I sell a bad ESM phone on eBay? So I got on the phone with a couple reps on eBay and this took me, you know, probably two or three reps to get a really good answer on this. I wanted a solid answer because, you know, we built our business on this. And um, so the guy that I talked to, he said he had a letter straight from eBay corporate that was confidential. Now, in their terms, they talked about this encouraging a legal activity policy. It doesn't mention anything about bad ESNs. It only mentions kill switch devices or iCloud locked, but no bad ESN. However, he did say in the confidential document, it did mention the bad ESN phones, but he couldn't tell me exactly what it said. So, you know, I talked to him for about 20 minutes. And I said, you know, we're, we want to make sure that we stay compliant. We want to sell on eBay. We make a lot of money on eBay and we want to continue to sell on eBay. Uh, so, you know, we want to make sure we're not going to get banned for selling a phone with a bad ESM. So he said he would get back to me. He'd write me a letter and, and you know, he would talk to a couple people at corporate and just get the exact details on this. And here's the letter right here that he wrote me. Since these phones are not iCall locked, there are no concerns for illegal activity. Okay, so now this is right from some of the heads at eBay right here, okay? So this made me feel a lot better, but I wanted to double check. So what I did was I replied back to him and I said, you know, I, I, this is great and I really appreciate this. Are you sure that this is okay? Because I wanna make sure we don't get banned. So they sent me another message back. Now I don't have that message, it's buried in my eBay messages here and I'd have to go search for it. But, but basically, they, the, the eBay, straight from eBay said, it's okay to sell bad ESM phones. They just don't want us to put it in the title. Those people obviously spelling it with zeros or spaces have obviously hit our blocks before and are trying to, you know, take different tactics to get around them and we'll take, you know, uh, you know, more severe action against them. They, straight from eBay said it's okay to sell bad ESM phones. They just don't want us to put it in the title. So here's what we're doing. In the title here, we're just putting check ESN or ESN issues. That's it. Just put check ESN. I want to clear up this big eBay scare about us not being able to sell bad ESN phones on eBay any longer. Now, by now, you should know that it's not that bad. Police say they convinced a mentally disabled man to sign contracts at the Park Meadows Apple Store. Um, basically, eBay is saying we cannot put bad ESN, bad e I M E I in the title. And that's not a big deal, guys, if you think about it at all. But if you look up the statistics and stuff, uh, it's like 90% or something of phones sold on eBay per day, millions of phones are still financed bad ESN. Okay, so this is, get that all clear, guys. There's nothing wrong with us selling bad ESN phones. They just do not want us to put bad ESN in the title anymore, like I teach and other people teach how to do that. That's all there is to it, guys. I've talked to eBay on the phone, like a lot of you have, and if you haven't, you should have. Blacklisted phones is different. We're not supposed to be selling blacklisted phones or iCloud lock phones on eBay anyway, even though a lot of people do. I went to one new repair store today. I got these dirt cheap. I'm going to go home, use the iCloud unlocking software, 
in more than like triple my money today. I will have that have them probably sold on eBay. And I'm not even talking about all the phones that I've been buying and, and iPads that I've been buying that are iCloud locked. We removed the Find My iPhone, we moved the iCloud, factory reset them, and I'm reselling them for more than triple the amount of money. You know how cheap we can get iPhones. From. Now the software might not remove remove it at the hello screen, but I have an online IMEI service that could remove it at the hello screen. Uh, depending on reported lost or stolen, there's different prices and different time frames, and the lost and stolen is not 100% guaranteed, but all the other ones are 100% guaranteed. Because I have an iPhone 6. Okay, what do I ask them? I don't ask them, hey, can you give me the IMEI number? No, because I don't care. A lot of people say, well, why don't you care? What if it comes up? You know, what if it's reported lost or stolen? Don't care. That means it's bad ESN. I'm selling it as a bad ESN phone in my head. I'm appraising it at this bad ESN knowing in my head, no matter what, if it's clean or not, I'm buying it as a bad ESN phone. I am selling it as a bad ESN phone. Where the trouble comes in there, there's no trouble. Now, look, for legal reasons, I have to say I'm not accusing anyone of anything. And to give these sellers the absolute benefit of the doubt, they do seem to be collecting a bill of sale and they do seem to be checking IDs with the bad ESN phones that they're buying. But given the fact that we know that many bad IMEI slash ESN phones are obtained through identity theft, who's to say that the people that they're meeting aren't using a fake ID too? In no way, shape, or form does a few words written on a page prevent a stolen phone from being sold to you. But what stands out to me is that basically all of the buyers for these bad ESN phones on eBay are pretty much overseas, and these top-rated sellers will tell you that firsthand. Listing a phone as bad ESN in your title, I've noticed they sell faster than a regular phone that you put clean ESN. Why? Because they're 99% of the time going overseas to overseas buyers through eBay if you're selling them on eBay I'm talking about. I want you to think about the sheer insanity of this situation. Under these pretenses, eBay knowingly acknowledges that bad ESN and bad IMEI phones encourage illegal activity. Yet instead of making a good faith effort to ban the practice on the platform, they have allegedly stated to their sellers, you can sell the item, but just don't include that detail in the title. Which in my opinion translates to, hey, you can do this, but just don't do it out in the open. That's really sketchy considering that eBay as a platform enjoys legal immunity as a marketplace but still gets to reap all of the profit of the things that fall through the cracks. Additionally, there is plenty of legal precedent to suggest that trafficking blacklisted iPhones overseas will land you in jail. Yet when eBay turns a blind eye to it, it's business as usual. Considering the company has openly protested and lobbied against various e-fencing bills, it makes me wonder just how much of the company's business model relies on fencing operations setting up shop on their platform. Like seriously, if you're eBay, why police this when you can run the entire thing almost like a honeypot? Let some sellers get big and then let law enforcement bust them every now and again. Law enforcement gets to collect and you get to profit off it the whole time. On a final note, I'll say that between the phones ending up in Haoshang Bay, the phones being stolen at concerts, and the people being fished out of their passwords, one motif is very consistent throughout this topic. Smartphone trafficking seems to go hand in hand with a wide array of other various illegal activity, and going forward, it will be interesting to see further efforts to combat the problem. You see, back in 2012, we saw a huge spike in violent robberies and other crimes associated to smartphone trafficking, and that's when this topic really got its first bit of exposure. Additionally, in and around 2013, even the Colombian cartel was found to have been tied to this trade. This is what led to further regulation, and while the introduction of the iCloud lock and other countermeasures were effective to a large degree at the start, here we are eight years later and the cat and mouse game continues. While I'd love to know what you guys think about all of this, this is Barely Sociable. Have a good night.